Good evening, friends. Uh, on beha behalf of uh, Higher Education Forum, we extend uh, a very, very hearty welcome to all of you for this very interesting and needed program of the day. Uh, those of you who do not know about the Higher Education Forum, uh, it is a forum of academicians, it is a forum of the students and the teachers to build capacity among the, the two most important stakeholders, that is the students and the teachers. That's the background of the Higher Education Forum. Now, we have been organizing a number of uh, uh, programs, a number of faculty development programs, a number of student development programs, a number of uh, uh, conferences, seminars all over the country. and. Uh, we have uh, more than directly and indirectly put together, we have approximately 4,000 members all over the world. So that's uh, about the Higher Education Forum. And today's uh, this particular topic is going to be a very interesting one because uh, uh, one of the futures, that's uh, our uh, uh, thought process, that one of the futures, and it is thought process of everybody, every faculty member, every dean, every vice chancellor, that the one of the uh, focus areas uh, in the digital, uh, internet-based education is going to be the online education. And therefore, the open education and the online education are going to play a tremendous amount of role for the uh, capacity building of the youth uh, and the capacity building of the corporate sector in days to come. Now, in, uh, as you know, that the, if, you, if you look at the, in terms of the statistics today, that the, the Indira Gandhi Open University considered to be the uh, biggest online university, biggest open university, put it that way, not for a small chain. They're the biggest uh, open universities in the world in terms of the number of the students enrolled. But in India, possibly the, the open education and the online education, they are not synonymous because we have a large number of open universities, but they're not offering the online program. They are actually offering the distance education program, which is slightly different from the online education program because the online education program is uh, mainly through the internet based of education. And therefore, semantically, uh, when we talk about the online education in India and, uh, you know, the open university and the online education, they're slightly different in India. Of course, the online education has picked up in India oh, today and there are uh, many institutes in India which are also offering online education. There may not be an experience new everybody, please, please, please. Uh, we, we, you know, we, we have a, a good number of institutes which are offering online programs. Uh, they may not be the standalone, uh, stand alone online institutions, but they are offering possibly the online education. Uh, I mean, as a part of their program, but that's a good beginning. Uh, but when uh, we did a research and uh, we talked to quite a corporate uh, people, that was approached a little bit uh, uh, before that, maybe about three years before when we talked about that. How do you? Uh, considered the graduates were graduating from the online education and how do you treat them uh, with the offline education? Uh, you know, the, the result was a little bit disappointing in terms of the online education because many of the corporate sector felt that the online education uh, uh, probably does not produce the same amount of the skill and the competent students uh, than what the offline education or the physical education provides. And that, but we have come a long way after that, after three to three years, we have come a long way after that. And all over the world to the online education, in some of the cases, they are, uh, they are uh, becoming more competent or they're producing more competent students than the online education. And therefore, in that context, this particular program of today is going to be an extremely useful, important, and very relevant one. We welcome Professor Devendra Kodwani. I mean, he is a proponent, uh, he's an exponent, and he is a very, very prominent figure in online education all over the world. He's one of the few Indians who is actively involved uh, uh, in the area of the online education. Uh, he has, uh, we are grateful that he has been uh, uh, today with us uh, on the platform of the Higher Education Forum. And I also sincerely thank uh, my dear and beloved colleague, uh, uh, Professor R.K. Jain, the director of the SIBM Hyderabad, who has uh, been instrumental in getting Professor Kodwani with us. So, uh, Jain Saab, now the floor is open to you. Would you kindly introduce Professor Kodwani and uh, take forward further? Professor Jain. Uh, can you get me the mobile disconnect? Thank you, sir. Thank you so much uh, for uh, all the efforts in uh, putting this uh, session together. And I mean, I, I, my words are not enough to, uh, I don't know, praise if I can use the word uh, for the kind of efforts you put in to put together high quality programs like this. And uh, I thank uh, Professor Kodwani for uh, accepting our invite at a short notice. In fact, uh, 
we have been coordinating on certain things for almost three months now. And uh, I was, uh, you know, troubling him with all last minute confirmations. And he was patient enough to, uh, uh, I mean, uh, 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 confirm to us. And it's a privilege uh, to have you on board uh, uh, today, Professor Kodwani. And uh, I'm also happy that, uh, happy and acknowledge here on this forum that uh, Professor Kodwani is actually doing a full-fledged panel discussion on upcoming uh, uh, international conference of ISDSA Global hosted by IIM Nagpur. In fact, uh, a much bigger canvas cities and we are going to have experts from uh, three continents where uh, Professor Kodwani is going to lead the uh, discussions. So with that, uh, let me take the present opportunity of uh, introducing Professor Kodwani. Uh, very difficult. What a program. I try my level best in uh, reading out uh, his achievements. And we have a really a pioneer and a stalwart with us uh, who has uh, uh, you know, invented a lot of things uh, in the space of open university, open education, online education, much before we were introduced to idea uh, in the in the you know COVID era during the COVID era he has been doing it for a long time now. Professor Kodwani, having uh, risen through academic ranks, uh, has uh, traveled full range of academic landscape as teacher, researcher, and leader, which he believes has made him realize the importance of humanity, frailty, and resilience of human nature. Professor Kodwani's research and teaching in earlier and current appointments have been in finance and accounting subjects in UK and India. I mean, uh, very much uh, in my area, my space of uh, work. Uh, someday I would uh, look forward to work with you, Professor Kodwani. Uh, he has a wide ranging teaching experience across financial accounting, management accounting, finance, corporate governance and ethics at both postgraduate and undergraduate levels. His research areas include finance, economic regulation of utilities, corporate governance and behavioral finance. He started his academic career as a research and teaching assistant at Indian Institute of Management, Ahmedabad, after doing his MBA. Subsequently, he taught at BK School of Business Management, Gujarat University, before joining the Open University, where he is currently professor of financial management and corporate governance. Professor Kodwani was the director of Tolani Institute of Management Studies. At the Open University Business School in UK, which is perhaps the only global online business school holding triple accreditation of AMBA, Equis, and ASCSB. He has designed MBA program, master's qualification in finance and HRM, has led creation of MOOCs and micro credentials, and now leads faculty of business and law, which includes the business school. During 2015 and 16, he established MOOC curriculum portfolio as part of this portfolio, he pioneered and accredited set of so as to award credit against prior learning attained through MOOCs, not only for the Open University, but also in the UK higher education sector. The project was also shortlisted for 2016 AMBA Innovation Award. More recently, he has inspired the exactly. creation of micro credentials that are offered by the Open Universities, uh -huh. Open University on future learning. May I request the uh, IT support to mute all except me right now? More recently, he has inspired and led creation of micro credentials that are offered by the Open University on futurelearn.com. FutureLearn is a global online learning provider that works with over 150 top class universities and partners to offer free and paid courses. In 2020, FutureLearn had nearly 15 million registered learners. Professor Kodwani is director on the board of directors of FutureLearn Limited. He is passionate about education and believes it to be a force for positive change for individuals, organizations, and society. Professor Kodwani's qualifications include four higher education degrees, one undergraduate, an MBA and PhD, in accounting and in finance area and a BA honors first class distinction, philosophy, politics and economics. A very enviable combination, Professor Kodwani. He is a senior fellow of UK Higher Education Academy and fellow of Chartered Institute of Management. I am sure we are going to have a great time for the next one hour uh, sharing experiences of uh, Professor Kodwani. Professor Kodwani, over to you. The floor is open to you now. Thank you so much. 
Thank you, Professor Jen, for such kind words and, and warm welcome. Uh, I cannot thank enough Professor Sen Gupta for having pioneered higher education forum in India, something that uh, is uh, sadly missing for a long time. And now we have a forum. I consider myself to be a uh, volunteer, a passionate patron uh, of that. If you would give me that space in the forum, uh, I'm, I'm with you all and I feel very, very honored and privileged to be invited to share with you some of my thoughts. Uh, what I have done, taken liberty to uh, open the canvas uh, 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 of conversation as education challenge for this 21st century for India, but I want to position the online and open universities offer what they can do in the broader context of the a challenge of educating hundreds of million of our youth and uh, and growing of population of uh, uh, professional uh, uh, people in India, because the opportunity for India to not only do good for its own people, but to good to do good to the global uh, challenges of uh, poverty reduction, the climate change, the inequality. I think given India's size and potential, uh, we can do wonders. But for that, we need to make sure that knowledge society, we are getting society ready for knowledge uh, intensive world. And uh, that requires role of uh, schools and universities. But today we will focus more on what we can do. And since the forum is of educationists, I would take liberty to paint a bigger picture for us to think a bit long, long term. And within that, I will position the role that uh, online education plays. So uh, I would start by sharing. Uh, may I start using the sharing uh, screen option so that I can share my presentation and talk through it? Uh, what I would do is uh, talk through the things and do that probably a little in a hurry so that we can have a lot more time for discussion and I can benefit from your queries, concepts, insights, and then indeed respond to anything that I am able to respond in, in, into the queries. So let me see if sharing screen works here. How does that, okay, I'll go here. Yeah, it does work, it does work, it does work. Okay, great. So uh, can you see the? Yeah, 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 I can. Title, okay, great, thank yeah. you. So, so what I'll do is, uh, this is the online, uh, kind of outline of what I'm going to say. Um, uh, I'll take a position. Um, uh, there are common challenges we know about the education, which are about access, quality, and cost. And I'll quickly run through some of those, uh, what we call perennial challenges of uh, uh, our education. But uh, as the title says, current dynamics, I think the since situation is changing for us, those of us who are in education, and what role therefore uh, universities like open universities play in India. And I'll add a different uh, uh, kind of a dimension to that uh, um, three, three four prone challenge of access quality and education uh, cost. And then talk a bit about how the learning itself is changing. So I'm taking a, a demand side view of India, uh, although the some of these challenges are equally applicable to China and uh, other uh, uh, developing countries in Africa. So today we have a gross enrollment ratio of about 27% in India of the about 38 million eligible uh, uh, people in the age group 1823. And uh, of which 11% is enrolled as Professor Sen Gupta rightly said in distance education kind of uh, universities. Uh, and uh, it gives you a breakdown of uh, how many of those are females. But college density, if you see in India, per one lakh population, we have um, you know, average 30 institutions. Uh, but in Bihar, it is seven and 59 in Karnataka. So you can see there is a excess is an issue even within India, the interest rate uh, comparisons are quite wide ranging. However, if I look at the supply side, uh, we got about 1,043 universities according to the latest survey of All India uh, Higher Education published by uh, Ministry of Education. 
and uh, we have got central universities and so Indira Gandhi Open University is our central open university and then we have got 14 state open universities and one private state open university and there are 110 dual mode uh, many universities as you know offer distance learning program on top of their campus based programs so that's kind of our supply side and you can actually do some comparative analysis with China which has got 2000 universities of which over 1000 actually have been set up in last one decade i mean if you search around you would find an economist article from 2016 where they were saying china was setting up one new university every week so we have a lot of catch up to do there the gdp ratio to education has increased doubled more than doubled so there, there is something that uh, we need to think about the uh, state provision of education versus private um, now, very, very briefly, a couple of slides on the Open University. Uh, we are a very small university compared to Indira Gandhi Open University. I, I think we have uh, very few students compared to Indira Gandhi Open University, but we are the largest European university with about 170,000 students. Uh, we were set up in 1969. Uh, the Open University here inspired the setting up of Indira Gandhi Open University in 1980s. Uh, and also in Alama Iqbal Open University in Bangladesh, Arab Open University in Middle East. So we are trying to take the supported open model of education that we call to world as much as possible. Uh, we have very few students from outside UK, <clears throat> about 7,700. And uh, we have done a lot of extension work of training the trainers or so teachers, for example, we ran that program in India also. Uh, about 12,000 teachers, primary school teachers were trained through online learning in India who are now doing very good work in Indian rural areas. Yeah. So uh, that's uh, us and uh, our students are different from uh, normal uh, HE students. Uh, average age of our students is 25 to 26. Average age of my MBA students is actually 37. So it's effectively an executive MBA program. Uh, and we have got 30,000 alumni of MBA program in the business school. Uh, what is very interesting, and this is where on online and open education becomes relevant in India also, to look at who are these students who come to the open universities. These are the students who have been underprivileged, did not have chance early in the life, and want to come back to higher education for a quality education to make difference to their life through education. So that is what is depicted here that 70% of our students are part-time and, and working people, and large number of them are actually females return into career, trying to rebuild their career, and those who had missed out early in life. Um, we, have the, we have more disabled students uh, in our population of students than some of the universities total student population in the UK. So, you know, we got over 25,000 students, 30,000 students, who had declared some sort of disability and we support them. Those disabilities could be physical, audiovisual or other. And indeed some of, uh, increasingly, unfortunately, we are seeing a lot of students declaring mental difficulties. So, you know, th that's also increasing proportion, but we are supporting all of them. And very, very few of them come with very high uh, marks or percentage in higher secondary equivalent, what is called A-level in India here in the UK, what we call uh, higher secondary in India. So we actually take students uh, with not uh, high grades uh, and that shows a lot about what we call uh, distance traveled by the student, the value added by the university, which is very high. Now I want to now here bring in few slides uh, that take talk about the demographic changes that are happening and that have direct relevance for the, I would say imperative of utilizing open education, uh, open universities and online educational models for the world, but it will become very obvious uh, for India in the next few minutes. Now, this is a short on um, the global population forecast. Uh, uh, you know, I'm, I take in a really long sweep there from uh, minus 8,000 years before Christ to current situation. And you can see we have actually grown to 7 billion uh, uh, at the time of uh, a millennial change, but now we are close to 8 billion uh, in 2021. 
And what does this mean when you look at uh, it, end of century? So by end of 21st century, there'll be about 11 billion people on this planet. Um, now, if you dig deeper into uh, periodic growth in this, I'm very interested in this graphic, which uh, you may not be able to read, but what it says is that people uh, above age of 60, okay? And this is relevant to education in future. Above 60, we had in 2019, about 900 million people, close to a billion. That will rise to, uh, by end of 2030, to 1.37 billion. By end of 2050, it will be 2, 2 billion people above 60. And by end of, uh, end of century, we will have 3 billion people of those 11 billion projection will be people above 60. Now, what is that population going to do for their mental well-being and remaining productive is going to be a huge challenge. Uh, India. Now, I want to draw your attention to current position of India's population 2019. Now, this is about 800 million we have between age group 10 and 40. I had chosen this band, 10 and under 50, because this is the group which needs uh, uh, knowledge, upgradation, uh, upgradation of skills, reskilling, learning new things as technology changes. So a very large percentage of these needs, needs uh, kind of qualifications, but also it will need lifelong learning options for people above 30 uh, to reskill, just to remain in job as a more relevant set of skills. So that's, what's that number looking like? 800 million, okay? Uh, when we go to 2050, this number actually becomes eight, 880. However, people above 60, above 50 goes to half a billion. And this is population between 50 and 80 years old, half a billion by 2050. And when you go towards end of century, Actually, the people in the younger age group go down, but population is maturing, and that goes to 650 million people who are above 50, but under 80. Now, I do expect people to be working very long. Uh, unfortunately, uh, people of my generation will probably be working until 75, but people coming after our generation will be working well into 80s. Uh, and we would not be in the privileged position of Professor Sen Gupta who can retire and uh, do fantastic social and important national work uh, during his uh, age at this point in time. But we, I don't think we'll have that kind of uh, privilege because of the demands of times. Now combine that demographic challenge with what is happening in the world of work and technologies that is uh, going to affect the requirements of what we teach and offer to students. So uh, in a nutshell, we'll be working longer. Uh, we will need to reskill and sustain commitment to learning will become an essential part of our living. Just like exercise, we will need to learn, learn for a very long period of time throughout life. Not because uh, we don't know, learn enough in the universities, but because the way technology and ways of working, production, et cetera, are changing so much that we will need to learn new things. Uh, throughout our careers. What jobs will be affected or unaffected? Uh, you know, we don't know today, actually, in uh, my son who is in the university now, I don't know whether he will do the same job in 10 years time for which he's preparing by studying his subjects now. Um, today's youngsters who are under 10 years of age, I can't even imagine what kind of jobs they will have. Probably they'll perform some jobs which don't even exist today. So how do you prepare and bring those things? But what is coming out quite clearly is that cognitive skills, emotional capabilities, uh, well-being, quality of life, and le le learning in third age, that is 55 plus is what, that's why I was highlighting those numbers uh, in demographics. 55 plus is called third age. Uh, so you have school age, university age, work, and then you have a third age where you again need to invest in learning. And there is a fourth age. I use the word third age because there is actually a university of uh, fourth age in UK, which is run by uh, people above 80 and it's a voluntary association, but it has got over 100,000 members and they call themselves university of th fourth age. So we will need to think as education providers, what, what do we do? 
Future, how does therefore a nice summary about future comes out in this uh, beautiful book by Mark and Reese, a scientist, um, and summarizes it beautifully for us that the erosion of routine work and lifetime careers will stimulate lifelong learning. Formal education based on teaching done in the classroom and lecture halls is perhaps the most sclerotic sector of societies worldwide. There is a boundless potential for model for the model provided by the UK Open University, a model that is now being spread widely via US organizations like Coursera, edX, where leading academics provide content for online courses. Teachers who do the best can become global online stars. Now, this is a book that came out in 2019. Uh, so the, I took the quote not, to, not because it has got open university in this context, although I took it when I was giving lecture for university, I took it for that purpose, but it is relevant to the future uh, higher education model. So how is it changing in terms of uh, future? So if it's a classical approach is, uh, we decide in the universities, professors, what to teach, how to teach. New approaches, um, where to learn, when to learn. Now, so it's, it's shifting, the power of balance is shifting from the teacher to learner. Initial education we thought was for lifetime. So you went to university, I went to university, thought that that has set me up for the rest of my professional work. But today we can't make that assumption that three or four years investment in the university is going to be enough for me to perform my role as a professional for the rest of my career. That will be a wrong assumption to make today. Therefore, we need flexible learning throughout life. Um, actually, there is a, a great writer in film uh, related personality, Lord Putnam, who is in Irish, uh, made a very beautiful statement that, uh, that fifth day, so he said, every fifth day in a week, that's Friday, use it for learning. So effectively set aside 25% 20 of your time, even in profession, just for learning. Um, fragmented knowledge will move to holistic because uh, space is not right in this forum, but the fact is most of the global challenges and even workspace context requires multidisciplinary, multiple skills kind of uh, capability in, in the people. Hence, you need a holistic approach to knowledge in the education. Uh, we will move from status driven to inclusive knowledge. Uh, and there is obviously this challenge of inequality has and has to have not, have nots to haves. So what does it mean? UN set up a commission about what is purpose of education, what kind of uh, education globally we need. And they effectively came up with uh, categorization of education in two nice models, what they call humanistic model and economistic model. Economistic model effectively is preparing people for uh, world of work, jobs, businesses, and so on. This, uh, so it's a utilitarian perspective on economics, while holistic humanistic model looks at individual as part of the society. What is their role? How do they flourish alongside their economic well-being? So, uh, the the uh, chair's uh, uh, name is Delors, and he and the panel came up with this four pronged view of lifelong learning. So you learn to know, which is a formal education, uh, learning for vocational activities, uh, learning to do, lifelong learning to live, to, uh, to be. So it's learning for personal growth and indeed a very holistic a view of uh, our living together, sharing this planet, to live together, learning for social cohesion. Now you can take whichever you know quadrant makes sense for different universities, but the balanced educational model requires all those things. And hence we can't ignore society and state and economic system when we think about what education does and what role we play. But that's a philosophical point. I'll move quickly from that. Uh, Professor Sengupta talked about the corporate world's view on the quality of online education or distance education. Now, to just to reassure colleagues that it is possible to design very high quality learning experience uh, irrespective of the mode of delivery. Uh, so, but it requires commitment to the quality processes. So we are, as a university, committed to the quality process. We are regulated by UK Quality Audit Agency. Uh, uh, and uh, 
uh, in terms of business school itself, we expose ourselves to uh, accreditors. That again is a check on the quality that we provide. So you had to have high quality processes to ensure that online education has space for uh, quality assurance, but it does take investment. You can't do it without people. You can't do it without investment in the learning design and assessment models and indeed having student voice uh, into the mix as well. So it is possible to design. We have a model that is very well respected. The open university degree is treated at par with any British universities. So it is possible to develop it. And I'll be very happy in another forum if people want to know more about the quality side of it or indeed during the discussion. And last three slides, um, I feel the learning model is changing. And now this is the, uh, Assume that learn, what does, what does go in a student experience uh, that go in teaching model? So if you see as a university, as a college, we decide what we offer, a degree, diploma, any qualification. And that has got within that embedded study goals, the program learning outcomes, and then a student goes through it and satisfies us, and then we give them award. And then we offer them a learning environment. In most campus-based universities, we offer them infrastructure for learning. They go to the classrooms, they have access to library, indeed they have access to other things, and of course, fantastic professors. And then we also effectively prescribe the duration of study as universities, that you will study this during this period of time, three years, four years, two years, and so on. We also define where they study, that is, in the classroom or in the library or at home. And then we also define when they study because timetabling is basically telling the student, you got to be in these classes at that time. Now, these are the variables which we control as providers currently. What happens to these variables when you have open university or online education? And indeed, if you, even if you did not have, what are these things doing to us with the flexible paradigm? Um, so, what has led, what we are now experiencing is a landscape of higher education where you have three types of provisions. First is traditional campus-based model, which we are all very familiar with. Right. Then there is online only educational model where there is no campus, people study entirely online. And then there are some universities trying to blend, particularly this period of uh, pandemic has forced many, many universities to attempt to offer educational technology enabled blended model of higher education. Now, that is happening when multiple modes are used by us. So you, you have a possibility that the same institution may offer campus-based tradition, traditional model or blended or online only offer. In India, we call them dual mode, but not in strictly online here. Then you have multiple modes in partnership. So this on the right side, you have people are using uh, learning platforms like Coursera, edX, Virtual Learn, and others, and bringing some of that learning into the classroom. So I remember designing uh, with my colleague a MOOC on project management, and uh, we had left it free for a while, and then we got the uh, interest from a couple of Australian universities who liked the MOOC so much that they said they would like to have exclusive access for that MOOC for their students who were studying project management in their, in their university. Now, suddenly this uh, university saw opportunity to utilize what was a ready-made good resource for learning class in the classroom, got it licensed from us, and they are now using it in the classroom teaching. Uh, and the lecturer facilitates conversations around that topic. So you can see universities are trying to play with partnership model also in the delivery. However, this has now made our landscape of higher education very fluid. Our landscape is porous now. The boundaries between campus-based education and other forms of learning are increasingly becoming thin and they would lead to a position where universities will start making choice how they want to play. So with the final slide, I would say how this is becoming dynamic. Uh, um, 
I, I see a convergence of delivery model that will be, so I take an example of business schools, but you can think of uh, universities. Uh, so on one axis here in the left side, you have customization of what? So effectively you start offering rather than full program of learning outcomes with 20, 30 learning outcomes, and say so this will become your BA or BCom or uh, MBA, uh, and start them breaking down by smaller chunks of learning outcomes. So customization of what we can offer to students. So some students may not be interested in entire gamut of uh, uh, functional areas of business, for example, or psychology. They may be interested in forensic psychology and uh, uh, counseling, for example, rather than full-fledged psychology degree. So you start making those bite sizes possible, small chunks possible. So you will start tailorizing the offer itself. And that will go hand in hand with personalization of learning experience. Now, personalization here is, uh, you know, uh, uh, we are now beginning to learn that certain students have strengths in certain areas, others have strengths in other areas. With the insights that the AI can provide in the learning behavior, in the strengths of the student, uh, in online, it is very possible to actually track which are the areas where a student is spending more time. For example, if you are teaching mathematics, you may find some students get stuck in certain type of algebra, Others are running swimmingly, uh, swimming smoothly through that paragraph or through that page and are able to answer the diagnostic questions, et cetera, very quickly. So you can start understanding who is getting stuck at which bit of the curriculum. Now, today it will look Herculean task for a teacher to understand the individual strengths and areas of uh, improvement for individual student. But with data insights that now AI can provide, you can actually understand quite at the detail level, where are the strengths of this learner and where are the areas of improvement that they would benefit from and therefore create a framework in online space to intervene at the right time when they need different type of support. You know, so that will become possible and you could create a personalized learning journey for a student, even if you have 100 students because technology will enable that intervention technology will enable that diagnostics, okay? And you can then, they say, okay, this person will actually benefit from an extra tutorial on arithmetic or chemistry or whatever. So that will be personalization. So that becomes our landscape as provider. And then the right side is the customer side, the learner side. So what are they looking for? How are they engaging with learning? Now we know today mobile devices, there's time spent on screen and touch pads is huge, so they want flexibility. And therefore, they say, I don't want to go to campus for three years, I will go for first six months, learn something, come back, start a job part-time, and then go back after a certain time. Now, interestingly, irrespective of this behavior that we are observing from the students, uh, some countries' funding policies are changing. So in the UK, there's talk of what they call lifelong learning endowment fund. So currently in the UK, uh, even though it is uh, fun, students pay for the university fees now since 20, 2012, students are given loans by student loan company and students pay through those loans. And when they earn, start earning after the age of 25, um, certain income threshold, they start repaying part of that loan installments over a period of time. Now, government is now actually thinking of offering, rather than giving them loan for the full degree, let us say 27,000 pounds, they're saying you will have X amount of educational entitlement. Use it over your lifetime as you please, okay, rather than go for three years to a university. Now, if that happens in 2025, which is the time horizon the policy is likely to be considered and uh, implemented if, if they get it through the uh, normal process in the legislation. Uh, then from 26 onwards, as a university, no British university can assume that they will have a student for three years because the student may choose to do 120 credits, which is you know catch points, uh, credit accumulation and transfer scheme. Uh, 
or they may say i will go through the whole degree or they may say i will do 30 credits and then drop out and come back after two years and so on to to absorb my lifelong learning entitlement now if that kind of a thing happens the learning becomes extremely fluid and a journey that we assume in our business model also as a university will become very interesting why how do you plan as a university but going back to this the student may choose to study for three months or 12 months or 24 months so that becomes time and duration commitment is going to be increasingly uncertain from the learner because of the financial cost and other reasons and the way they are absorbing learning how are they engaging with learning is also very interesting so a student has got increasingly more control over the duration they commit to and how and where they learn now that means liquid liquid learning so how do you play on that liquidity curve as a provider you may choose to offer only you know fixed programs and campus based or you may offer something in between or you may offer something very flexible choice will be the university's choice and indeed here also universities will choose whether they want to offer uh, you know high concentration full degree no personalization a mass education model or more personalized um, and uh, more tailorized personal offer so this has opened up now opportunities for uh, uh, open universities because they will be better placed. They offer already modular learning. An online model makes it very possible to do that. We are experimenting with some of these things. And uh, indeed, we think there is a way of delivering high quality online education. Uh, we have a model that has been successfully tested for the last 50 years, and we continue to evolve and learn from this. But I think given India's challenge of educating to the size that we have about 500 million currently, which will rise to 600 million. And mind you, in India at the moment, we could define our eligible population as 18 to 23. I think that is a mistake. People who need to learn are not only in that bracket, people who need to learn are about 23 to 50. Also, if we had to move into knowledge intensive uh, societies, we need to think about them because that's a very large market potential but at the same time need for the country to respond to. So I'll stop here and uh, invite uh, colleagues to uh, ask any questions. And indeed, uh, I'll try my best to respond to any questions colleagues may have. Thank you. Professor Kodwani, I can start. This is Sen Gupta here. Yes, please. You know, it was an excellent presentation. I have one doubt. You know, in India, uh, many people, including the recruiters and the uh, regulators. Uh, they are doubtful about the online education or they are still not recognizing the online education for the practical oriented courses, for example, engineering. So yeah. you have a model for an online MBA, fine, but you don't have a model for an online engineering degree. Yeah. So how, how do you propose to solve this problem? Yeah, uh, very good and, and relevant question, Professor Gupta, Sen Gupta. Actually, we have what we call STEM faculties, science, technology, engineering, and maths faculty. So Open University teaches uh, a range of subjects in engineering. We don't teach uh, at the moment mechanical engineering and civil engineering, but we do teach, uh, uh, I think, uh, metallurgy. Uh, we teach all the science subjects, biology, physics, chemistry, and we had developed a range of digital uh, technologies and labs, which we uh, use as part of teaching. Or a simple example I can give you of, let's say, teaching uh, astrophysics uh, or astronomy. So we have, um, we have a telescope in Tenerife in Spain. Uh, and uh, access to that telescope is given to the student remotely. So actually a student may get assignment to map the stars in whichever part of the world using that telescope and manipulate the telescope through remote control on computer and make the reading and write a report. We have a lab in the university where we have created such framework where student can manipulate a digital photographic camera or they can manipulate a small robotic probe on surface moon, um, which is uh, effectively a lab room uh, in Open University where we have created surface of moon and an uh, actual robot that student can manipulate uh, from their computer and analyze the samples on the surface of moon. And we have put some stuff there, which is real. So uh, in addition, we have very good uh, technologies for teaching other science 
uh, in nursing, you you know, a direct answer to your question would be like, how do you teach nursing program online? Uh, because nurses had to learn some practical skills like drawing blood from the veins or uh, you know vaccinating. So we have created a virtual uh, toolkit whereby actually a uh, student puts on a what you call um, augmented reality goggles or glasses and uh, it's similar to you know pilot uh, being uh, prepared for through simulator and spaceship. So, you create actually a virtual environment in which a person has got all the parameters to take injection and put it through body and see what happens and if make a mistake, what happens and so on. So where technologies enable us, we have developed quite sophisticated science and engineering related tools. And our science degree is very popular actually. Within law school recently, we adopted something from nursing program uh, to teach law online, our law, our law degree is very popular in the UK. We are the largest provider of uh, legal education. Um, how do you simulate court scenario? And uh, uh, you know, can we use the augmented reality tools to bring around the discussion in the courtroom? Uh, how can students assume different personalities of being a defendant, being a prosecutor and so on. And those kits are working very well. We are getting very good feedback. Uh, so in most cases, technology is giving us now enough tools to offer very sophisticated uh, uh, education. Uh, actually, in some cases, it is much more eco-friendly. Uh, so in biology, they have been doing a lot of experiments with augmented reality and actually asking students to go out to the field and put data right from their own surroundings to bring biology to life. So we have moved on from sending what we used to call science kits, engineering kits to the students at home for laboratory work. And we used to then send them to the local colleges for doing experiment. We have moved on a lot from that and are offering now high quality science and engineering. Uh, and technology today, for example, 3D printing and so on is enabling a lot of things that we can do, but we, we have a go way to go. But I think it is just a matter of time and that time should not be very long uh, when we will have quite sophisticated engineering uh, type of uh, training possible online. Good, good. Yeah, we leave the forum open for question and answers. Yeah, Professor Jayanti, you wanted to ask something? You can ask. Yes, sir. Professor Kodwani, excellent session. And so broadly you covered the holistic classical approach and the present approach, inclusive knowledge, holistic knowledge. Uh, only thing uh, regarding this virtual reality or augmented reality, what is going to be the future, uh, how close uh, are we going to have these uh, five uh, cognitive uh, perceptions, you know, especially perception of touch and perception, this some of the senses, you know, it will not be, uh, will it be having uh, identical with what uh, we have in the physical realm? And this is actually uh, stimulated by artificial intelligence because that uh, conscious awareness, awareness is different in the virtual reality, unlike in the uh, real uh, reality. So how exactly it will uh, replace the conscious awareness of uh, the experience? Yeah. Um, no, thank you, uh, uh, Dr. Um I'm, I'm going to do a speculative fiction for you here. <laughs> <Because> <laughs> okay. physically, the physics will not permit, uh, you know, the touch experience. Uh, the virtual, yeah. right? you, I, can't touch, I can't touch your hand virtually because that's simply not yeah. possible physically. Yeah. So what will probably happen, if you look at some of the um, advances we are making in the the study of neuroscience and cognitive science. The more we are learning brain, uh, more we are big figuring out how brain ex helps us experience the reality, how it helps us perceive the reality. Now, more we learn about how brain is functioning, I can actually recommend a very powerful book that has just been released by Professor Anil Seth, who is at University of Sussex. Yeah, I know, I know that Anil Seth, I know, yeah. Now, yeah. the, what I feel that time will come when technologists and neuroscientists will work together and work out a way whereby an intermediate 
wearable technology, be that we will have a headphone or such things, where you will be able to activate certain parts of brain uh, to have that experience of smell, for example. So there could be possibility that I show a rose on the screen and mm -hmm. ask a person to go near the screen, although they will not get fragrance from rose on the screen, they will be triggered that experience of rose smell in their brain by some electric impulse that we'll be able to trigger through the wearable technology and then still experience uh, the smell virtually. So because we are now understanding how brain works and we are, I think we're just scratching surface of it, but soon technologies and educationists will start using that uh, in terms of uh, making the experience real. Uh, 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 probably an example which is going close to what I'm saying is use of uh, toys in Netherlands. Uh, there's a robot which tries to teach language to babies. Okay, so baby is learning, let us say, A, B, C, D, and the robot is listening and understanding. It has got the program, program of language, grammar, and everything. Increasingly, it plays with the baby in a way that it is raising the cognitive demand on the child uh, and in the process teaching them language. It is also learning the mistakes that child is making and then saying, okay, this is where child is not figuring out the difference between and and or. So it gives it more expense experience of using and and or, for example, in the sentences, because it's interactive, uh, you know, toy. Uh, for teaching language to the child. And it keeps them entertained when the parents are not at home, but effectively it is using the algorithms to learn from what child is saying and slow, slowing down or increasing the pace of learning or uh, difficulty or the ease of uh, challenge that it is posing to the child uh, in that interaction. So this is one ex example of how technology and the knowledge of psychology and learning language is being combined into the toy to be an entertainment tool for the child, but at the same time, an instructive tool for the child. Next question, please. Uh, this is Sunil Patil, Professor Kodwani. Pleased to meet you, Sunil. Uh, two questions, one question on demand side and one question on supply side. Let's look at the supply side first. Uh, you know, we, we tend to use the word business model in the field of education. Uh, I have a very strong objection to that word itself. Instead of business model, nobody talks about education model. Uh, and, and unfortunately in India, my observation has been, and people always talk about education is the best business in India. <laughs> so I think to, to, to adopt new ways of learning and new ways of teaching students we need a very firm commitment from the management side. We need absolutely a very flexible mindset to adopt and accept the changing scenarios because there are a lot of vested interests, believe me. They are operating in this business, uh, so-called business. And those vested interests will have to change their mindset to accept this reality. So that's a, that's a big issue on the supply side. Now look at the demand side. You're looking at a country which is 80% in villages, where there is hardly any access to even broadband. Forget about simple internet, but even access to broadband. Because if you have to use technology for open learning, distance learning, and all this, then the basic infrastructure has to be in place, and which has been badly exposed during pandemic in the last two years, how miserably it has failed in India. I mean, there have been cases where students have actually gone to the top of the hill just to get some network coverage so that they can listen and attend some lectures. That is the reality of this country. Now we can talk a lot about technologies, virtual realities and augmented realities and, and various tools and techniques, but there are very serious issues on, on, on the demand side. And, and the, for this population to, to actually get benefits of this, there is a massive spending that is required so that infrastructure could be put in place. 
Now look at the GDP percent, GDP spend, which continues to go down year on year. None of the recommendations of the committees have been implemented. The minimum spend required is 6%, which stands at 50% today. So given all these scenarios, uh, and uh, Dr. Sengupta highlighted one of the critical issue actually is the acceptance of this mode of learning in industry, which seriously lacks. So how do you address all this? Uh, I mean, yeah. there, are, there are a million issues, but yeah. again, uh, how do we make sure that GER gets up there, access to that 80% population is sound and healthy, that makes sense. They are also given enough freedom and choice uh, so they can select the subjects. And there are many issues, again, on the supply side. Are the faculty committed? Are the management committed? Do they really want to accept these changes? Yes. Uh, I think um, I agree on all the points you have made, uh, Sunil. Uh, if I may call you, and please yeah, call yeah, me. Please. please. I, call I me prefer to be called by first name. And call me Devendra Allah, please, no problem. Um, so um, the supply side, I, I could not agree with you more on allocating because uh, infrastructure for education, and it includes the digital infrastructure, but also even the physical infrastructure for schools, for example, in India. I feel um, we need to devote even more attention to the uh, uh, pre-university education in India because you can create all these good, good institutes and so on. But if you don't prepare students well in the pre-university, pre uh, they will not benefit as much as they could from the university education because you end up spending first year as a foundation year effectively. Yes. So um, I would uh, I would fully uh, endorse the demand for more allocation of GDP towards education. Uh, you are right. I am very conscious of the fact that large number of private uh, institutions are run less for education, more for business of education, uh, and that's a reality of life. Unfortunately, again here. Uh, if you look at the core reason behind that is the lack of adequate state funding because had you invested over decades in enough number of community colleges, good colleges, uh, you know, we would have we not been reliant on uh, 40,000 colleges in India, size of India is so huge, 40,000 is nothing. So uh, we knew, and I don't think private sector even can cope with that kind of uh, demand because they would go obviously to the areas where uh, payoff is better. They will always come up around the areas which are near urban centers because the land value pays off in long term more than the education itself. So there are these strange incentive frameworks that we have created for private sector to find education as a venture in, in which they have gone. So that's a fundamental challenge on the supply side. Um, and uh, digital infrastructure, yeah, I, I can't agree with you more. I feel it. Uh, um, I mean, we had actually once upon a time, uh, I think, a great opportunity in the post and telegraph department. You know, the post office network in India was phenomenal. And we have allowed that to actually disintegrate over time because we separated telecoms from post. Had you kept that synergy, because there's a direct synergy between effectively it is communication enabler. And had we strengthened post offices, you would have got very little more investment into them and enable the training of the postman into more telecom operator and information officer and so on. That, that among four villages, if you had one such functioning good post office, you could easily then add on and annex to that and convert into a digital room for people to do. But that all required a lot of imaginative thinking uh, than quick and short term fixes. Uh, so you are right, there's a long haul there. My hope is that uh, the mobile technology, because the data cost is still much lower in India, with even if the driver of that is commerce, hopefully it is giving enough access to people in small towns, at least to 3G, hopefully uh, in five years time, 4G, that we will have accessibility. And we will need to learn from what we can do from educational technology point of view is to lower the demand on bandwidth. So one experiment we did in uh, Africa, 
where we again had a similar problem of no access to remote parts of uh, Kenya and Nigeria and other villages that we worked in, in and some of the even, um, even less accessible parts of uh, Sub-Saharan Africa. We created offline toolkits of the same learning resource that could be once downloaded on telephone, people could access it. So we will have to uh, do this thing at a scale that once you, even if you got one hour access to data and communication, you could download the whole material, but it should not be simply PDF file. No, that's not instructive material really. PDF is not equal to uh, learning design material. Uh, so we had done some experiment. I think we, we can help people if they want to look at it. Uh, and we have a challenge. Uh, so in the university. So we, one thing I did not mention about open university students is we have about a uh, uh, small number of students in what we call secure areas, which is like prisons. Okay, so we have students in prisons. And uh, interestingly, a lot of them do my course accounting and law. Um, uh, so I don't know what's the correlation, but that either they're trying to learn more about law by being within the law's boundaries. Uh, now, how do you serve a student in prison? for example. So we have, they had no access to internet. They can't have access to internet by the rule. So we have created formats, multiple formats of learning resources. And we send certified properly trained security cleared tutors to run for them tutorial classes in prisons. So we have that technology. One could say, okay, here you have a person who is in, by law inside uh, beyond the digital world. But actually in India, as you say, there are people in villages remote. By default, they are away from digital world. We could use some of these techniques that we use to create multiple formats, which could quickly be downloaded. What we can't offer is interactive support or peer group learning experience that other students have. But other than that, we can do a lot of things. So technological cost, the educational technology itself will need to invent, innovate, to require less bandwidth and offer these choices to people. That is one kind of a ray of hope I can <laughs> visualize. That's, that's, that's a good thing. We can only hope for that. Yeah, that's right. Both the demand side and the supply side, I agree. Sir, a quick question from my side, just for information, that the, uh, in international uh, uh, parlance, uh, what is the price differential between an online program and a regular program? Uh, actually, in the UK, we don't have a big price difference. Uh, so our degree is priced mid-range between. So in the UK, as you may know, the price is regulated uh, in the sense there's an upper limit on how much a university can charge. There's no lower limit, but there's upper limit of uh, £9,300 per year for undergraduate one-year degree. So three years, it will be £27,000, £28,000. And then there are some universities which are for 5,000 pounds per year, others charge 7,000, we charge between uh, six and 7,000 per year. So our degree costs about 17,000 pounds to student. But the big catch is, and we did a um, empirical analysis of this, and this may be a relevant point to be made in the context of online education generally. So our students don't come off to the campus. Okay, so they don't spend money on additional money on accommodation and maintenance cost. Uh, they remain in work. So they are actually active in, actively engaged in economy. So that means they are paying taxes, they are uh, contributing to economy. And therefore, if you take the net of cost of on online education, actually it is much less than even what 17,000 I am cost asking. So we actually, commissioned a research piece uh, with independent uh, firm in London and say, what is the impact of open university on British economy, given our model of learning and teaching, which is online. Yeah. And we found that we were actually, our, our annual budget is about uh, 450 million pounds uh, as a university. So that is the cost to, let's say, cost to the nation uh, of supporting open university because we are publicly funded. Uh, and we, when, when we looked at the, if impact of it, economic impact of our activities in terms of jobs retained in the economy and, and income generated, et cetera, we found we were contributing to the tune of about 4.3 billion. Oh, great, Maybe. great. So that, that's one way to make argument for importance of a online education that actually, it, if you retain the workforce within the economy uh, and train them and upskill them, 
you know you are returning so that's that's one way i mean if sunil doesn't mind me using the word that this is how you could rationalize the business model of online education as a social good uh, so we always say um, and uh, we are a university which is run run on values social justice is the core of our foundation so we don't run for profit and we try to put every penny back into the education uh, so social good if you see i mean it's very difficult to argue for higher education as a public good if there are economists in the mix here but uh, a large part of it is public stroke social good and and one can make case for it and actually perhaps reach out to even philanthropic entities in india some of them are directly going into it but actually one could reach out to some good philanthropes and not so much for direct funding of education we can do but to inspire higher quality research on higher education as a social good and make case for it politically and uh, administratively as a policy kind of a think tank kind of pieces of work because i don't see many think tanks working on it we got data collectors like all india survey but we don't have apart from nipf which some, sometimes publishes uh, papers on education and epw but not high quality research is happening to justify why 21st india needs significant investment in higher education and by that i mean not just in the supply side infrastructure but also in staff development the biggest gap we have in training of staff phd doesn't necessarily qualify you to become good teacher actually you can become a great teacher without phd but you need to phd because people need to appreciate the importance of knowledge creation So sorry, Sen, Professor Sen Gupta, I was going on longer than what you intended. Yeah, fair enough. That's a good question. That was a good answer. Yes. Any, 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 any one or two questions we'll take from the audience. Uh, shall I come in? Please, please, please go ahead. Well, good evening, I'm Dr. Shiv Saru, Igno Regional Director at Nagpur. Good evening, uh, Dr. Devender. It was a really very informative and very useful uh, talk. and i want to add only two points about our own experience what you said that you followed in uh, uh, african countries here also we follow for online lectures because covid has forced everyone to go into the online lectures so we give online talks and other things what we do is because in uh, rural areas they don't get uh, perennial connectivity of the internet especially we have a, in nagpur we have a gadchiroli district which is very tribal and remote district so what we do is we put it recorded and uh, keep it on the youtube and other uh, facebook uh, sessions so that whenever they get connectivity they watch them because we get a students phone call night at 9:30 he mm -hmm. says that he gets uh, his mobile signal at that time only mm -hmm. so whenever he calls he calls at the night time so this is one point whereas for prisons we also have in igno we follow the prisoners education and in igno we provide free education at nagpur we did one experiment that we used a radio also to teach to the prisoners and um, so the prisoners they are provided with a radio and they listen sit at the radio at the specified time and it was a mediated phone in radio counseling and that that also we followed this to i want to share a supplement with your activities thank you yeah. no, very uh, thank you professor sivaswaru that's a local innovation and that's what drives uh, you know uh, going back to sunil's point about autonomy autonomy not only in the management of institution one needs autonomy to innovate and that's where the role of places like ugc and aicts and whatever the regulatory commissions we are they need to let teachers innovate find local solutions as they work in different parts of the states and districts and and professor sir sorup's example is a great example of that local innovation and improvisation i think i'm a great believer in tinkler <laughs> you know i like to tinkle with things innovate what it works in different contexts what works in uk will not work in india or it may not work in india so we should be able to experiment and that autonomy academic autonomy in that sense is quite critical last question any last question any last question Ravi Jain, you are there. Ravi, Professor Ravi. Yes, yes, I am there. I think uh, Mr. Shankar Krishna Prasad want to ask a question. Yeah, yeah. Please, please. Uh, Mr. Prasad, uh, you can ask your question. Thank you very much. Uh, actually, I put my question in the chat box. 
uh, I was only talking about uh, the efficacy of virtual classrooms. At the end of the day, what we find is a physical classroom versus virtual classroom. The efficacy of lesson to a student, it's absorption. Uh -huh. And uh, the outcome, uh, whether the purpose of actually imparting uh, a subject is achieved effectively or not. So uh, it's, it's my thing is that in all the virtual conferences, whatever we do, uh, I'm from Hyderabad Management Association. I look after its international desk as well as IMA coordination and uh, membership uh, you know, development. In all of our interactions, what I find is the effectiveness is lost in virtual meetings. I know, I mean, we have not much of a choice, but they would say that there has to be some hybrid way of looking at the things in future as the pandemic recedes, because it is more or less proved that virtual meetings are not that effective. You, you have comments, please. Thank you. I think, uh, um, Professor Shankara, you made two points. One is virtual meeting, another is digital, uh, virtual classroom and physical classroom. I think I'll, I'll separate them two because the classroom Okay. Uh, has a different session purpose and, and meeting has a different purpose. I, I can comment on the meeting also if you want, but I'll focus on classroom issue. So what is implied okay. What is implied in your question is that, okay, let us compare a classroom session with a virtual classroom session and what is more effective. So um, there are two things in that. One is you are assuming uh, that the learning atmosphere, the interaction that takes place within the classroom between a teacher and student and other students and all the students and teacher, which may be supported by some even gadgets in the classroom, like uh, you know screens and whatnot. Uh, it assumes a particular mod, mode of enabling learning. Okay, So I, I like enabling learning as a better word than teaching. Uh, so you enable learning in the student's mind through various means of physical talk and uh, interaction with them, question answers with them, you give them a task, they perform, you give them feedback, they ask a question, you answer and so on and so forth. So that is the transaction that is happening between a teacher and a student in a physical classroom, which is very much focused on how teacher conduct themselves in relation to student and the task in front of them about delivering a learning outcome. So if I'm teaching accounting, I know how I'll be going in front of student, what I would have prepared and, and what students would have done. When we go into virtual classroom, so if you just copy this model as a from a classroom to just digital experience of uh, sitting in the virtual classroom, it will not be same. It will be very different experience. Actually, IE Business School in uh, Spain has, has created a 200 screen classroom where a student, uh, you know, all the students are all over world and the teacher actually is in the well of the classroom, which is basically 200 screens on the walls and tries to mimic that same experience of a being in a physical classroom. The difficulty with that analogy is that when we design the learning for a student who is studying at a distance virtually, we don't even assume that they are sitting in a group. We are assuming they are sitting uh, by themselves. Sometimes they will work in groups. So that the learning design that you do for online learning is very different from the way you design a session for a physical classroom delivery. So we spend enormous amount of time. You would be surprised for us to know that for designing one 30 credit module, which is about 300 learning hours, one credit is about 10 hours. I will put together a team of academic staff of three or four people. They will be supported by what we call experts in online learning, teaching, design. And they will be supported by other people in media, editors, publishing, and so on. It might be a team of about nine people who will produce one module. And they take up to 12 months to produce one module, just one module. Why? Because every step of learning outcome, every learning outcome requires academic resource, a learning activity. And there are eight different learning activities which we have found through research that help with the effectiveness part of your question, that the learning effectiveness depends on what learning activity a student engages in. 
Now, I'll give you a quick example of two, which are easy, very easy to understand. So when I give a student some material to read, we call it assimilative learning. So a student is assimilating from written material, so one way. When I ask them to talk between them, that's a communication activity as a learning activity. So there are eight different activities which we have found through scientific research in educational research, not the technology, but educational research, how we learn. So you learn from all these uh, theories of learning, how a learner learns, and then try to use the online platform, um, embed those learning activities, and then go through that. And then effectiveness is assessed through the formal assessment, be that assignment, quizzes, examination, that's how you find whether the learning has been effective or not. So the learning design for a classroom session, physical classroom session, and learning design for a virtual learning environment is very different. So one has to be mindful of that difference and uh, invest time in that learning environment, design of learning, and then assess the outcome. And we know that uh, from, because we assess students and our students are assessed by the market, by the employers and so on, and they don't find them any less than uh, any student who's coming from the campus-based university. So that, that's the difference, uh, Professor Venkat, if I made that clear, Shankara. Thanks so much, Professor. I mean, that's been uh, very, very satisfying for me. And then, yes, you made me look at uh, the other angles going so deep into it. You design and probably customize for the virtual thing. So thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you. I think, uh, Professor Zabendra Kodwani, I think uh, we had a, we have had a very, Fabulous session for me. Let me put the list. Actually, the the you know there is a lot of uh, um, misunderstanding in India as far as the online education goes. You know, we started that uh, people think it is not good. People think it is not appropriate. People think it is not adequate. People think it is not sufficient. People think it does not impact the necessary competencies and so on and so forth. It's a question of change in uh, mindset, probably, which is needed uh, uh, both from the supply side and the demand side. Even the regulators have to understand this thing. Uh, at least I have been trying hard to talk to the regulators about the importance of the online education. I have been the, the my personal capacity and as well as the my institutional capacity written several mails to the regulators to encourage the online education uh, from one angle. For example, today as I told you that the today they don't encourage the engineering education to be online. They don't mm -hmm. recognize it. It mm -hmm. doesn't make any uh, much of a sense actually. So mm -hmm. I think there is a need for a change. So this session has opened all of our eyes. We thank you very much for giving the brilliant examples from all over the world as we got the efficacy of the online education. I think it was an excellent session. I also take this opportunity to thank Professor Ravi Jain uh, for mm -hmm. arranging this particular session, initiating this particular discussion. And thanks to all the audience for the kind ear. Thank you very much, everybody. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Sen thank Gupta. You, sir. Thank you, sir. I, I will send you the copy of presentation, Professor Jain and Sen Gupta, then you can 